With the embrace of big data practices and the emergence of fintech and neobank players, the worlds of banking, technology and data transparency have collided, sending ripples throughout the entire financial services ecosystem. Open banking is now the common denominator, as banks are doing more than just managing and safeguarding money. The Open Banking Framework is imploring banks to hand over access and control of financial data to consumers. But while Australia is one of the newer entrants into the banking regime, the UK has had these mandates in place since 2016. But what even is open banking? How does it affect consumers? And how will Australia ever measure up to the UK? Like you, we're curious too. Opinion X, captivating. Curiosity. Open banking creates an ecosystem of services for customers to manage their finances, utilities, and other products in one single step. The scheme endows customers with greater financial control and the freedom to permit financial institutions to share their data with accredited third parties, like budgeting apps, energy providers, telecommunications companies, or mortgage brokers. Consumers can then conveniently and securely compare products and services to manage their spending habits or tailor their financial needs. APIs understand and translate this data, like internet banking logins or account details, so that the software systems can seamlessly communicate. Open banking is one of the key factors to rejuvenate Australia's financial services industry, especially after the Royal Commission uncovered major systemic failures. In response, the federal government introduced the consumer data right in 2017, a system that gives consumers greater control over their data and the ability to share it with trusted third parties. Diving headfirst into the banking industry, it will eventually roll out across the energy and telecommunications sectors. As of July 2020, the big four banks are required to share credit and debit card data and deposit and transaction account information. On the other side of the world, Europe and their data privacy law, the GDPR, have been pioneering this movement since 2015. But could open banking be a secure, transparent and consumer controlled flow of financial information that we've been waiting for? Well, we asked open banking expert Eduardo Martinez Barrios what he thinks about open banking's power to overcome traditional barriers in the financial services industry. So open banking has been enabled from a perspective of uh, having a standard of interfaces, in this case using uh, RESTful APIs, in order to, one, provide banking services through a greater scope of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, public. And when I'm saying a greater scope of public is uh, uh, thanks to the let's say, introduction of, a, of this new player within the value chain of banking services that will be the fintechs. Uh, fintechs are uh, leveraging their market proposition using the banking services. When I'm talking about banking services, particularly here in the UK, we're talking about account information services, payment initiation services as a different uh, as a difference with uh, Australia that you are just focused on account information services at the moment. Um, so from that perspective, literally we're opening up the door to a greater revolution in terms of how can we provide services in a much more, uh, I would say, democratic way So I think definitely you have a good opportunity here to reach out more population and to provide good services. I mean, because with banks in the end, uh, the key element is to provide banking products where, I mean, banks are good at it. Uh, Sometimes, and this hour, better said, uh, uh, I think through through time, we have seen that banks, in order to evolve interfaces, digital interfaces, it's, it's not as flexible as a, as a small fintech company. So mm-hmm. literally, let, let's let's empower uh, this value chain by using the expertise of each of the players. In this case, banking products by banks, 
and then uh, interfaces to the public through fintechs that they are very good at. I would say a good number of uh, participants that are trying to disrupt the market, to provide new services. Uh, and in the end, the most important thing is that the consumer might be a person or might be a small or medium company will benefit of these propositions where the time to I mean to achieve something, let's say a loan application, a credit card application, an offer draft, uh, instead of taking days, now will take seconds because that information will be able to be assessed and validated in a matter of fractions of a second and therefore a customer when applies to one of those products will benefit from that or let's say um, increasing the way uh, that um, that one person or a, or or, a, or an entity can execute payments so that will definitely change the the canvas of payment processing mm -hmm. options. We're seeing that kind of uh, shift in terms of uh, uh, evolution yeah. uh, for banking services. Consumers have finally realized our data can be just as important as our money. And this is where cybersecurity becomes a key concern. But by introducing read-only access to product and transaction data first, Australia is definitely focused on getting open banking right. In a new age of digital transparency and big data, open banking could be that process that restores the broken relationship between financial services providers and consumers. One fintech supporting this is Split Payments, a real-time direct debit platform. And Trevor Weistaff, the CTO, explains how open banking is the holy grail and the innovator for a more intimate relationship with consumers. It's improving and should improve further the competitive landscape, right? It's giving customers more options. Um, it's giving fintechs and, and incumbents, you know, more, 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 more power to, to, to drive change. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. Um, at the moment, open banking in Australia is only like a, a read access type of open banking, right? So it's all about being able to um, uh, it's all about empowering individuals to share their data with, in this case in Australia, what we call an ADR, so an accredited data recipient, um, which is which is great. A bit of a quasi analogy is you have all these all these people or organizations that have these potentially have these great ideas, but there's this significant barrier to entry um, that currently exists and is slowly kind of being removed. Um, by by these kind of uh, process, or not processes, but but um, the existence of say open banking, for example, and then hopefully eventually payment initiation, real time payments, etc. Right, and as these kind of barriers fall, it, it, that's what that what that's what opens that 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 door, if you will, um, and, and and allows that innovation to happen. Right, so I, I think the approach, especially in Australia, is to go okay. Well, first let's start with with really getting the read access right, right? And that's not just about how we share your data, but also what the, con the customer experience looks like, um, what, what they get used to. Um, and there's probably like a feedback loop and some sort of iterative process there where that will improve. And at a certain point in the future, then we go, okay, well now it's time for payment initiation. Um, I think like more, like now more than ever, um, consumers are, in, are, are are open and receptive. <clears throat> excuse me, open and receptive to change. So, I think we're in the right. We're at the right time to do it. Because the nice thing about open banking, um, and and especially when you've got both the read and write side of, of of open banking, is you can do everything from here, right? Or whatever kind of device you might have. So if if third party providers have better access to data. They can make better, they can empower customers to make better automated financial decisions, which in turn lead to better social outcomes. Both established banks and neobanks have formed chambers of exclusion. They either target the older or more loyal generation or the younger and more tech savvy consumers. But open banking could be the common denominator. 
with transparency, access, control, and technological power at its core, there is more opportunity to provide personalized services that will assist the financially excluded. Ismail Chaib is the COO of Tesob and the Open Bank Project, and he recently shared his opinion with us about open banking and how it can benefit a financially divided world. The users would own their data. I think this is very important, quasi philosophical, yet extremely important idea. So, to me and you, you know, we will be able to uh, access our data, own our bank data. And, and use it on our own terms. I'm going to share it, we can share it. I don't, we don't. You know, but that idea of data ownership and data sovereignty, uh, I think it's going to, to shape not just banking in the future, but many industries. Case in point, I think the CDR in Australia is a great example of that, right? So the customer data, right? The other sort of type of more tangible benefits is that, you know, today you have, you, you know, you can't do, you, in, in today's world, you can no longer do this kind of uh, one one size fits all. Thing. Like you can't have one bank providing the same product to all of their customers and expecting that this product would uh, fit with everyone. It just doesn't work. Right? We have so many. Uh, different, you know, expectations, behaviors, needs are very different, you know, from one another. What open banking enables you to do is to really customize your products to these micro segments. Right? And this is something banks would never be able to do, right? Really um, give you the product. Financial inclusion means uh, the ability for for people to have access and to use financial services, financial products, right? So today around the world, there are 1.7 billion people. They do not have access to any financial product, right? From credit, from the financial services institutions. So, uh, so they don't have a bank account, right? And that's a big problem, right? So, and most of these countries are in uh, sort of developing countries. And it's a big problem there because, you know, lacking a bank account means you have no no kind of uh, easy convenient means to save money uh, you're probably going to be using cash you know you're you're uh, so there are there are lots of troubles around that and one of these tools that help with financial inclusion i believe is open bank and and so and you say okay how, how does that work so i think um by opening up data by enabling third-party actors to build personalized, customized applications that would attract more people to the banks, right? And that would get people to use those financial products more. So by opening up data, by providing this headless uh, banking experience and APIs, you would encourage a host of new services to, to open up. And service and part of these services, there will be services for the affluent, but there will be also services targeting the, the poor or targeting the financially good, excluded, sorry, and helping put them into the system. Open banking is a global initiative that is undeniably revolutionizing the banking market. With instigators like the GDPR and already hundreds of providers enrolled just in the UK, the scheme continues to inject a once stagnant financial industry with accessibility and transparency. Australia's regime is definitely driving changes the industry has needed for a long time. And we are pioneering the way for effective services and personalised customer experiences, guaranteeing long-term success. So, how else do you think open banking is transforming the global banking industry?